Welcome back, class. We're going to talk for a few minutes about uh, sources of monopoly power. And, and one of the main sources uh, that we talk about monopoly power is, is the barriers to entry. Remember, on a competitive market, it was easy entry, easy access, or ex easy entry, easy exit. Um, on a monopoly, um, monopolists spend a lot of effort uh, trying to ensure that there's not easy entry. And I think they they mentioned it a time or two. I've heard it other places, but I think they also mentioned a time or two in the, in the text that entrepreneurs can smell a profit that they compare them to bloodhounds. And if if you have a monopoly in place that has a product, a unique product that has very few substitutes and you're making significant profits, especially on the economic profit side, you're gonna have entrepreneurs start kind of sniffing, you're gonna have them start sniffing around, trying to see, can they generate or can they produce a sim somewhat similar product so that they can jump into that market and grab some of those economic profits. So for, an, for a monopoly or a monopolist, uh, barriers to entry are a significant uh, driver when it comes to monopoly power. And barriers to entry is just, and they provide you a definition in the text, characteristic of a particular market that blocks the entry of new firms in a monopolistic market. So barriers to entry, you're, you're blocking uh, the entry of new firms. And they the text goes into I don't know, three or four or five um, rationale or reasons as to why um, monopolies end up with, you know, barriers to entry. And the first one is economies of scale. Remember, we talked about economies of scale in, in some of the earlier texts or some of the earlier chapters. And from a uh, monopolist perspective, the long run average cost decreases as the firm increases output. So, that long run average cost is coming down as the firm continues to increase output. And remember, that's economies of scale. Those average costs are coming down because the more output is generating um, additional, um, th those costs as you increase output is actually offsetting uh, some of the fixed costs that you have. So. Again, remember, as that long run average cost is going to continue to come down as, as you go out across that output continuum and continue to generate a more output. A natural monopoly is a firm that confronts economies of scale over the entire range of output demanded in its industry. So that's, that's their definition of a natural monopoly. A natural monopoly, it's less costly for one firm because they have a lower average cost than many smaller firms at a very high average cost. So the monopoly can, can generate a lot more output at a lower average cost and they actually start to drive the smaller firms or the more costly firms out of the market. Natural monopolies require heavy upfront investment in infrastructure. And again, the infrastructure adds to those fixed costs, add to your total fixed cost. So that's why the monopoly is gonna to try to generate, a, continue to generate output because it's going to take and offset more and more of those total fixed costs as they go out over the output continuum. Uh, and when, when you think about natural monopolies, um, I think about water, Think about electricity, depending on where you live. Um, I would say I would say natural gas, but um, in the in the Atlanta market, you can actually bid on natural gas to drive your natural gas down. Um, internet, internet, cable TV, uh, natural monopolies. Um, I have Comcast, Xfinity, whatever you want to call it, and for my zip code in the Atlanta market. That's my only option for internet and cable TV. I can get cable TV if I want that package. I can get cable TV, like maybe through direct TV or somebody, or I can stream some TV, but I still have to have the internet. So um, Comcast is my internet provider and they're the only game in town. 
And economies of scale create barriers to entry by being able to reduce average total cost as output expands. Remember, they're trying to uh, reduce average total cost. And the main driver of that is they are taking those average fixed costs are, and they and they drive those down by taking the total fixed costs and expanding them over greater and greater output. They pr produce more to lower cost than multiple smaller firms. 800 pound gorilla in the market. Drives smaller firms out of business by producing at a price below their average total cost. They keep new entrants from wanting to enter the market and they increase their total profit. So by their economies of scale, they're driving all of these functions or all of these factors. A second way that um, barriers to entry is control of key inputs. Uh, there's very few firms in the market that can control all of the key inputs or all the factors of production. One that, that comes to mind, and, and maybe you've heard, diamonds are forever. And if you've ever heard the Ron White um, I guess it's a blue collar comedy tour. Ron White has kind of a, a skit in there and he's making fun of De Beers and, you know, their, their slogan, you know, diamonds are forever. Um, and De Beers, um, really intelligent because they took the De Beers group and early on in the diamond industry, they went into South Africa mostly, especially the continent of Africa, but a lot of it was in South Africa and they uh, cornered the market. They cornered the market. They controlled all of the inputs in that diamond market. And so for years, they were maybe not the only game in town, but they were pretty much the only game in town. And they, from a pricing perspective, most jewelers viewed them as the only game in town. Uh, now there are some close substitutes uh, rather than um, you know, the continent of Africa, your findings, diamonds in some other countries, they've got synthetic diamonds now. So um, the De Beers, um, and we'll get into it a little later in the text, the De Beers monopolistic control is starting to erode. So one way that, that a monopoly um, creates barriers to entry is, you know, the approach that De Beers took by controlling the the key inputs in the, in the diamond industry. Another way that they uh, generate barriers to interest through government restrictions. And a lot of times the government restrictions, uh, and again, it goes back to, you know, internet, cable TV. Um, I don't know whether anybody has a landline anymore, but for a while, the, you know, they were pretty much monopolies on a landline. Um, in some areas, gas, water service, electric service um, are all somewhat um, monopolistic. And again, depending on where you live, but somewhat monopolistic, depending on the level of government restrictions, whether through laws or regulations. And a lot of it goes back to the fact that uh, a natural monopoly has to have a lot of in infrastructure. They have a lot of upfront total fixed costs. Um, in theory, um, the government provides special privileges or granted by the government, and that's what you end up with. And again, landline, water, gas, electricity, um, internet, cable TV, again, depending on where you live, is going to drive what level of the government intervention or government restrictions could result in lower price for customers. That makes sense. That's uh, the government is noted for deciding that they know what we, what is better for us than we do. And so um, in theory, uh, the government regulations and government restrictions helps to drive a lower price for the consumers. Restrict entry to encourage innovation, such things as patents. Um, and if you have a patent, uh, you have exclusivity for, I think it's 20 years. So um, if you can develop through innovation, developing uh, a new mechanism and get it patented, uh, you're in pretty good shape, uh, at least for that, that piece of the pie uh, for theoretically 20 years. Copyrights uh, for creative works are good for 75 years after the artist's death. So um, again, creativity, innovation, um, 
government restrictions help to, to drive that. It's socially undesirable in the short run without the creativity would suffer and society loses in the long run. So that, that's the downside to government um, restrictions because again, the government restrictions, they are reducing competition to keep firms from driving the economic profit to zero. If there's a positive economic profit in a market, especially in the competitive market, you get more and more firms come in and eventually they will drive that or, or compete, depending on which terminology you want to use, they will drive that economic profit to zero. In a monopolistic world or a monopoly market, um, you don't have that competition coming in, so it's not going to drive the profit to zero. In theory, with government restrictions, uh, you improve the quality of service. I'm not sure I totally agree with that, but at least in theory, it sounds good. They confer economic favors. Um, taxi service. Go to New York City or, or you know, especially before COVID, uh, go to New York City and there are, you know, hundreds of, or thousands of taxi cabs all over New York City. Uh, and they are conferring economic favors uh, to taxis. Now, um, Lyft and Uber and have definitely eroded some of that market. But in places like New York City, there's, there's still a lot of individuals use taxis. Um, florists in LA, uh, and, and what monopolies try to do is they try to control the supply and the price. Um, they, they give some examples in the text, florist in LA, because you have to take um, not only flor florist in Louisiana, not Los Angeles, but florist in Louisiana, uh, you have to take an exam in Louisiana to be a florist. And I guess the exam includes you have to show people that uh, you can generate floral arrangements. Um, actuaries, um, the exams for actuaries are written by current actuaries. And, you know, current actuaries, um, just like the American Medical Association with doctors, they're trying to control that supply because they want to keep the prices up. They want those economic profits to continue high. So, uh, you've got, you know, current actuaries writing the exams. And if you've, if you've ever known anybody taking an actuarial exam, when they go in to take it or even after they've taken it, they don't know what the passing score is. It's almost like a subjective or a moving passing score. Um, and especially like the actuaries, uh, there's, you know, different levels of expertise. Uh, and again, I mentioned doctors, the AMA, um, tries to control the <clears throat> supply of doctors. Um, one of the other um, ways that you that monopolists um, try to um, contain or, or, or keep various to entry in place is switching costs and network effects. Market power can be maintained because a switch to a competing product is costly for consumers. Think about Think. Think about uh, cell phone switching. How difficult is it to switch from one cell phone to the next? Think about um, think about changing from direct TV to cable TV or vice versa. Um, switching costs uh, and network effects can be extremely costly for the consumer and can be um, a barrier to entry. Uh, for new market or for new firms trying to come in and, and trying to um, insert themselves into the market. Uh, network effects, uh, situations where products become more useful, the larger the number of users of the product. Um, and again, these network effects are extremely valuable and they deter um, entry into the market. Network stickiness, formidable barriers to entry. Um, they're luring new, not existing users. So think of the uh, social media. They've, they've got some of the social media giants um, are extremely adept at generating new business. They are trying to steal existing members. They're going in and they're trying to lure the new members. They're building their market. They're building their critical mass or their market base 
based on new users rather than trying to go in and 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 steal um, members from another social media platform simply because of this you know switching cost and um, the the hassle and maybe it's not so much a dollar hassle as it is the time value and trying to get a new network set up or trying to get a new social media platform up and running for you. Um, and at that point, we're going to stop and we're going to come back in the third segment. We're going to talk about get a little more into the weeds on the monopolistic model. Talk to everybody in a few. <laughs> 